Welcome to Sunday Night Live. I am back this week live coming from Sioux Falls, South Dakota. I'm Dr. Boz and this is the Dr. Boz channel. We are improving your health one ketone at a time. And tonight's uh, episode is live streamed here. So I am going to warn you now that if it suddenly goes blank, it's because I was a little brave and courageous for doing this subject one week after my mother died. So I'm going to start out like I normally do with uh, a check of my glucose and we are going to do a few things that are standard operating procedure here. And then we're going to give a, a nice uh, uh, conversation about um, the updates on how to improve your own health. And we're going to use my mother's story uh, for all the teachable moments that we can because uh, she would be very proud of that. So we're going to start by looking at my glucose uh, and ketones at the same time. And um, I have uh, a little bit of cold fingertips here. It is in South Dakota. There is snow on the ground. And November 1st, that should be expected here. But every year when it comes, we all chirp about it. Uh, let's see here. And oh my goodness. Hmm. Hang tight here. <laughs> so uh, my, it's been a few days. So I will tell you that over the last two weeks, actually it's about three weeks now, I have had my own uh, distractions with my, the health of my mother and then planning a funeral that I was not anywhere ready to do. Uh, and my ability to check my numbers has been <laughs> like the, the last thing on my mind. Uh, so let's see if you can see those. So glucose of 87, ketones of 0.7, or excuse me, glucose of 89, ketones of 0.7. I am going to have a little BHB tonight because I am human. And over the last couple of weeks, I have not really fallen off the wagon as much as I've just not been very focused on me and my health. Um, and I, I'm, I need to reset too. I need to get, <laughs> I need to get out of a, a very deep level of sadness that has been uh, standard operating procedure for about 10 days now. But this is day one. So here is uh, just what we usually do on the show is I will use, use one of the supplements that I talk about uh, and I will test it at the beginning and at the end of the show, uh, mainly because I've been duped by having supplements that don't do anything, but you pay a lot of money for them. So I try to use this example live on YouTube to show you um, how, um, how I, what the numbers do in real time. Okay, here we go. So um, yes, tonight's uh, title uh, is uh, something very intimate to me. And I am gonna share a few, few links with you in the show notes below to try and connect you. For those of you that haven't been following the story or didn't follow me on Facebook over the last couple of weeks, um, I have uh, had the eulogy of a lifetime that I gave four days ago about my mother. And my mother has been um, um, a story that I have used as a teachable case, uh, not because I was planning on a big uh, YouTube channel with followers to say, how do we get healthier? but because I loved my mom and she was very sick. And um, I am very thankful for all of you that have reached out, that have posted on Facebook, that have followed her story. And I wish it would have turned out differently. Um, tonight I'm gonna give you a bit of uh, what I learned about not just COVID, but uh, what, what would I have done differently. I, I know that many of you that tune into this channel are, um, are Americans, but also across the globe. And we have learned quite a bit about this virus. But I think as a physician, I'm an internal medicine physician, and my mother was very high risk. And we're gonna go through her story, we're gonna understand where she'd been and what, um, what COVID actually did. And then at the end, I will share what I would have done differently. And not in a way that says I, yeah, we'll get there in a minute. So tonight when I was, or today when I was deciding, can I do this? Can I get in front of a live audience and talk about my mom? I 
put on the prettiest dress I could find. <laughs> I got a piece of uh, her goofy jewelry that <laughs> she made um, and I'm wearing it in her honor. And I am, I am being Rose Bosworth's daughter by saying God has given me a gift of education, but also of communication about health. And I think the reason you tune in to this channel um, is because you want an in-depth conversation and a clear uh, answers and uh, explanations about how health, how can you resurrect your health? What is it that if doctors had all the time in the world uh, with each patient, what would we want them educated on? And I use this channel uh, to show you what I teach my patients, but also how I cared for my mother. Um, so let's get started. Um, let's begin uh, by sharing with you how my mom got sick. So um, again, my mother died at the age of 76. Um, I was praying for 96. I just didn't have any place in my brain for 76. <laughs> but uh, this is my mother, Rose Bosworth. And um, again, she uh, died on October 25th, which is a week ago today. Um, she is um, healthy in this picture. This is 2018 and is the day that this book was uh, published. In fact, it was taken about the day before the book was printed, uh, started to be printed. But she looks healthy there. Anybody who looks at that picture doesn't need to be a doctor to say she's, she looks pretty good. But I think the backstory of where she'd been for about the seven to eight years before this picture is um, where I'd like to take you on a story to show you why I worked, why I'm, I'm sad to have her go. I, 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 it is the most heartbreaking uh, story in the past week. But the part that I'm very thankful for is she didn't die sick. She died the healthiest she's been in 30 years. And if there's one thing I know with my whole heart, it's that she would be saying, help do for them what you did for me. And so we're gonna give you a piece of that and we are going to, um, we're gonna teach you how I, how I helped her. So if we go to, um, some of the more not so pretty pictures of my mother, which she might kill me for, but um, this is another picture with my youngest son uh, born in 2006. <coughs> so again, she's healthy in this picture. And uh, this isn't just an opinion. When you look at health of, uh, of people, uh, there is actually software out there. I'm just gonna blow her picture up so you can see her face a little bigger. Um, but you can see she's healthy. Uh, you don't have to guess. Uh, th there's actually software out there that says what is the, um, the DNA age of people. And uh, there's lots of ways to look at telomere length and spend a lot of money to say how healthy is their chronology for health? Meaning, can you age cells faster than they're supposed to age? And the answer is yes. Uh, so when looking at what is the body's health versus the, um, the time of their health. Like my mother was 76 years old, but I would say her health was somewhere in the 50s for just guessing what, um, you know, I didn't do any tests for that. But it turns out you don't have to. There are uh, some softwares out there where they look at the, the age of people based on what their photos look like. And um, after quite a bit of study, they have learned that you can spend a lot of money on telomere length but the human brain, when it looks at somebody and they look healthy, does a really good job of predicting uh, their cellular health, their cellular age. And so you don't need to be a doctor to look at that picture in 2006 and say, yep, um, she's not just happy as can be holding my son for his, uh, uh, his baptism. Uh, she's healthy. I mean, you don't, that, there's not a negotiation there. But I'm gonna show you what happened over the next couple of years. So this next picture is in 2008, and um, this is her picture. So this little boy now is the same little boy in that picture. And here is mom, uh, and she's not healthy. Uh, something's gone wrong. Uh, she has not been diagnosed with cancer at, at, at this point yet, but uh, she has put on an, an incredible amount of weight, and she doesn't feel well. 
uh, at the next uh, picture um, is again, he's uh, probably six months old. You know, this is my youngest son there. Uh, so they're, they're fishing together, they've got a dog, but if you look closely at that picture, um, you're now starting to see uh, that your brain says something like, this, she's not as healthy. Uh, and if you look closely at some of these pictures, she has a gray look to her face. Again, this is before she was diagnosed with uh, cancer, or right around the time she was diagnosed with cancer. And her cancer was of the white blood cells. So again, the white blood cells in her body needed uh, are needed for fighting off infection but they're also a big marker for repairing your, your repairing your body uh, so let's just do a couple more uh, of these pictures because i think it drives home the point but uh, i want you to i want to make I'm, I'm gonna make a point here <laughs> um so we're gonna save that one for last um let's go here oh we're gonna save that one for last sorry <laughs> okay this is good enough uh take this guy we're gonna turn that off oops that's what i wanted on all right, so here is uh, here is when my son Chancellor is, uh, I think he's four years old or five years old. So again, she's in the throes of her cancer by now. She's had a couple of rounds of chemo, at least one round of chemo. I bet the next one's coming up. Um, this was on a chemo day. And actually, this is the day that the picture on the front of this book, I don't know if you can see this, um, that sh she's being kissed by her grandson and it was on a chemo day because she was said, bring him over before I go in. Uh, I just, I don't, I don't want him to see me when I'm feeling bad. And of course she has a higher risk of infection after chemotherapy. So there's a uh, subtext. They want to know if you've had high blood sugar. Well, they should want to know if you've had high blood sugars. They might not take time for that. Um, but her other risk factors were she's had, she'd had cancer. Um, she'd had a few infections, but she lives a really, pretty wholesome life. I mean, she lives on a farm. She's got good energy. She was still working at this time, volunteering in several organizations, which I couldn't even write them all for the eulogy of how many things she volunteered for. But she was doing lots of acts of service. But what was happening behind the scenes was her energy was going lower. And um, when I, when you look closer at the other parts of her journey, um, you know, she, those pictures were there to show you not just that she did get sick, uh, but how sick did she get? And um, where does this correlate to, to someone watching this channel for how could you uh, use this story to improve your health? So here my mom was, she had this cancer and everybody in the medical books would say, yep, CLL is no big deal. Um, you know, these cancer, this cancer will grow, we'll hit it with some chemotherapy, it'll push the numbers down. Um, then the cancer will grow up again and we'll hit it with some more chemotherapy, it'll push the numbers down. And the, the interval between those chemotherapies was how fast her cancer was doubling. So at first it took like four years for the cancer to double and we could measure it by what her white blood cell count was. So if she showed up with a white blood cell count, uh, yours and mine would be like 6,000, 8,000. Um, hers was 30,000. And so by the time it, the, the measurement from going to 30,000 to 60,000 took like four years. But when that interval got to the point where it was doubling every eight weeks, mm, there was not much uh, we could do about, uh, I mean, there was a life expectancy that was associated with that that, that warranted chemotherapy. So we would say, you know what, this is time for chemotherapy. We're gonna use some pretty strong chemicals to wipe out that cancer. And unfortunately, like many problems in medicine, it wasn't getting at the root of why the cancer kept, I mean, where was the cancer growing all this energy from? Where was it getting all of its fuel from? It simply was the very scientifically based, very evidence-based formula for how do we manage this long-term as opposed to how do we cure it? And as I, um, as I walked with my mom and um, she gets to a point where I'm now living in South Dakota, where I'm going to every doctor's appointment with her. I have my own clinic filled with lots of chronic illnesses. The doctor is actually doing exactly what I would do. Um, but in 2015, I unpacked a huge, uh, um, I, I think of it as embarrassing, but nobody else really knew this either so embarrassment probably isn't the right word anymore but i was embarrassed that i didn't know why a ketogenic state was beneficial and i do a lot of things in my internal medicine clinic but i 
manage chronic disease. I, the goal is to reverse chronic illnesses or prevent them. And I specifically put energy into resurrecting brains that have been damaged from poor sleep, from addiction, from depression, from Parkinson's, from um, poor sleep. And so my energy was put into studying the ketogenic diet and why they were using this in some of the most advanced people in the country uh, for repairing brains. And of course, I wanted that for my patients. As I read about this, I then come across the information where they're using it in cancer patients. And um, my mother and I end up in an oncology office together where her white blood cell count is now, I think, 300,000. She is doubling every six weeks. And right before the oncologist walks through the door uh, to tell us what her blood count has, is, you get your blood count drawn, you go up and wait in the waiting room, you go in to see the doctor and he tells you the blood count and that is really how they make the decision is whether or not it's time to do, a, um, to do chemotherapy. So right before the physician walks in, and she timed this as perfectly as she, and this is total classic mother, uh, she says, you know, honey, and by this time, she's not doing well. She's really sleeping 18 hours a day. She's, again, put on plenty of weight that you saw in those pictures. Uh, she's not the energetic, healthy mother that I've known for, you know, at that point, 40-some years. Um, and she says, if he says chemotherapy, I need you to know that the clothes I want worn at my funeral are downstairs in that closet in the top shelf. And in walks the doctor. And of course, she had big lymph nodes. She was very sick. Uh, he says chemotherapy. We walk out of that um, doctor's office and I'm standing in a hallway and one hallway leads to her, uh, the place where you take the pink slip to set up the chemotherapy. And the other hallway leads to the front door of the hospital. And by this point, I've read enough about the ketogenic diet that I know she's, I know she's right that another round of chemo each time we've done this has been knocking down her brain she's not thinking very well she's very low on energy and every time we did chemo she just never came back to her fullest life uh, my kids don't remember don't think of grandma as the energetic person that she was they think of grandma as sick and i do something that i i rarely do which is i said mom would you like to see what i would do uh, the first part of that conversation was I asked my mother, do you trust me? And she's like flippantly says, sure, I, of course I do. Um, and I said, no, mom, do you trust me with your whole life? And she gets emotional. And she said, I'll do what you say. What would you do? And we walked out the front door. We didn't take the pink slip where it needed to go. Um, we drove 100 miles to my family farm and we did the things that I do now as a routine for people when I'm trying to improve their health through a ketogenic journey. And in this book, if you haven't read this, I really, as a tribute to my mom, I'm so glad I wrote this. I'm so glad I wrote this. Um, I didn't think of myself as an author. I didn't, uh, I tell stories, I do medicine, but I didn't ever consider myself a writer. And so thanks to my husband's encouragement <laughs> of saying, you should write a book. You should write a book. And I wanted to punch him like, I'm tired of you telling me that. So I finally wrote the book. Um, and honest to God, it sold 70,000 copies at least and has been um, translated into a couple languages. It is um, the story of that, of what happened from the moment where she said, I trust you, what would you do? And I walk through this very awful story where she should die. Everything about the treatment plan that we that she was under, everything about her health was she was overweight. She was fighting a cancer where uh, the inf it, it affects your immune system. She'd been on antibiotics 50 out of 52 weeks for the previous year. And it wasn't that she didn't have access to great health care. I, I watched over everything that was done and it was still not working. And I will, I, if you haven't uh, read the book, the show notes has the, have the book in it. And it is uh, the first step of me saying, I need to change how I approach medicine in my own internal medicine clinic. Because much like what my mother was receiving was care that does have evidence base to improve the problem, 
but not reverse the problem. And I will be honest, I didn't think a lot of things could be reversed. The textbook doesn't teach you about that because nobody does that. Her cancer isn't supposed to be reversible. She died with cancer. It was still in her system. Um, but it brings me to um, a, a paradigm shift where I, I really was engaged with uh, my patients, teaching them how to get a healthier lifestyle, trying to educate them on what I could see through their lab work and through their, their journey of, of being in an internal medicine clinic. And I wasn't making them any healthier than the rest of my colleagues were. <laughs> I was doing the same thing. And uh, when it comes to the shift I have made in my clinic and in my approach to medicine, uh, I can tell you that there are plenty of physicians out there that like what I do and like what other physicians uh, that are using this approach do, but they cannot join. Uh, they cannot join the journey while working for a corporate healthcare system right now. Uh, and I mean that by, I have my own clinic, I run my own internal medicine clinic, but what happens in that is um, you have, I don't have an office manager saying you're not making enough money, you have 24, you know, 20 minutes to see these patients, and if you start educating them on nutrition, it's, first of all, it takes way too long to do that in a 20 minute visit. I'm never gonna answer all the questions. Look at how long most of you watch this channel. And I do really honestly try to answer questions, but that doesn't turn into a valuable relationship of changing behavior uh, when you offer them 20 minute segments every three months. And there's another subtext to that, that if you're looking at internal medicine, I don't get paid for teaching you about, your edu about nutrition. Um, that is considered counseling and Yes, you can bill for counseling by the minute, but it will not cover the cost of paying for the front receptionist and your nurse, let alone bringing home a paycheck for my family. So there's a lot of other processes going on in the medical clinic that make it very difficult for physicians to educate about how do you get them better? How do you get them better? And it's through this story that um, my mother's, uh, my mother's you know, journey in that book where she should have died every Physician that reads it says, I don't know how the heck she's alive. I don't know why, how, how she lived. And that was 2015 to 2018. And at 2018, I'm just gonna show you this picture again. Uh, this is what she looked like before the story started. And um, uh, this is a picture at my, my oldest son's graduation. He graduated in 2019, but you can see my sweet mother there. Oopsie here, that's not what I wanted. Uh, 2019, click here, this is all I want. So if I blow that up, you can see both my mom and dad there. Uh, and you can see that woman is, is healthy. She is definitely healthy. And um, that, uh, that is my oldest son when he graduated from high school. Uh, much better, there isn't, you don't have to be a doctor to know she was healthier there. Um, when you look at the other picture of when she, uh, um, this was the day, the week the book was, was printed. You look at that picture, she is healthy again. And she acted healthy. She was, again, volunteering in her community. She was back to sleeping only eight hours a day, which is normal for her life. Uh, she, was, um, she was grandma. She was doing all the things she wanted with her kids and her grandkids. Um, and you, yeah, um, the eulogy, which it will be in the show notes when we're done. I just posted the eulogy to, um, to YouTube. Uh, it, is, uh, it is how do you raise a strong woman uh, as a woman of faith? And many of you watching the show might know that that's who I am. I, I am very independent, but I'm also uh, a woman of faith. And uh, the eulogy was by far the hardest speech I've ever given. Um, but I think did an honorable job of showing how, how could you learn from some of the things she's taught me that no other woman has ever taught me. Uh, and that is a journey of faith-driven, honoring God for a talent that you've been given without bulldozing and wrecking relationships that are easy to wreck as a strong woman. Um, I will... I will let that be something that you watch in that other in the links below, because uh, I want to get to what happened uh, to her with COVID. 
So you can look at this picture. She is healthy there. I actually think she was healthier looking the week or two before she got COVID. Um, and she was doing a few things that were really important to her health. Um, we were, we had, when you finish the book, you'll see that she was definitely healthy enough to live through something that was miraculous. She should have died. Uh, and she wasn't like 50. She was in her 70s. This was not an easy task, but it does teach you that it, you don't have to end up in your 70s unhealthy, which is what she had done. Um, this is preventable. You can stay out of my clinic. Uh, you can stay away. But there are some steps that you need to do. And especially if you've got a high blood sugar, especially if you've been carrying 10 or 15 pounds weight, you can look at the pictures that I'm in with my mother. I was overweight at that time too. I was following in her footsteps, good and proper. Uh, and so not only did she save her own health, but by being her beacon and being her coach, it made me better at this too. Which gets me to, um, since 2018, we're now in 2020, uh, she's, she definitely was the healthiest she's been in 30 years. That if there was ever a time that a woman with CLL, which is cancer of the white blood cells, not for a week or two, she'd had it for 15 years. Cancer of the white blood cells for 15 years could beat COVID, it would have been in the health she was in in this last month. Um, so we talk about ways that we strengthen a, an immune system. And this doesn't happen like, you know, I know people come to this channel and say, I want to learn how to do the ketogenic diet. And I would tell you to pause. Uh, number one, if you haven't read the book or listened to the book, the story of what it can do is really what's hidden in that book. You hear the story of my mom and what I was doing to help save her life, but you're also learning the science behind what ketones are really doing deep inside. It's not just about weight loss. Yes, my mother lost weight, but I can show you lots of folks that have lost weight that couldn't fight off a virus to save their life, especially one as nasty as what COVID does to an elderly person who's got chronic diseases deep inside their body. And my mom's story started with um, 12 weeks before she got COVID. Uh, she got a little report from her oncologist saying, all right, there are a couple things going wrong with your cancer. Um, the cancer wasn't really growing, but the scar tissue her cancer lived in her bone marrow, and the scar tissue from her bone marrow was really pushing out uh, the other cells that grow in that area as well. Uh, so in your bone marrow, you grow white blood cells, red blood cells, and platelets. Her cancer was of the white blood cells, and so the platelets and red blood cells still have to grow in the bone marrow, but they had fallen to a lower level. And that's a sign there was scar tissue in her bone marrow. So we sat down and had a heart to heart that yes, my, my dad had just died, so she was grieving over the loss of her husband. Um, his health, unlike her health, his health had dwindled quite a bit over the last 18 months. So she was tired. She, she needed to recover and just rejuvenate. And we talked about what are the best things she can do to protect against, um, you know, when dad was sick, she really hardly ever left the farm. She was just a caregiver for him for about 12 months before he died. So now she's a widow, she's on a farm, that's very isolating, she's about as extroverted as I am, and she wanted to return to the community. And I said, okay, we do need to prepare your body as best as we can to, to live, which means to be as strong and fight off the immune system problems as possible. So the online course that I had put out this spring when I got stuck in Hawaii, with my son and my family, we went to visit my son in Hawaii. He was going to school there. And that's when the whole world shut down and there was not a flight home for 90 days. And that was a wreck on my personal clinic, but I put an online course on saying, what is it that I do now with my patients? What have I learned since doing this story with my mom? And the, uh, the link below, bozmd.com forward slash shop, that's where that course is uh, um, offered. And the course is what I would do if you're my patient, except it's COVID. Uh, nobody's going to reimburse us for paying for that visit or for the hundreds of visits it probably would take to get patients really doing well. But it's about the education and about being in a community of people changing the same behavior. So the course really lays out how do I run my little community here in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. We have a free support group every Friday for anybody that wants to learn about the ketogenic journey and what would I do. You cannot get into my clinic without taking the course. Uh, and the secret is most people that take the course don't 
need an internal medicine physician. Now they need the education behind that. And that's what my mother kept saying. My friends all need to do this. My, you know, she would go to church and say, my preacher needs to do this. And I'd say, well, let's teach him. So I was writing a book on an instruction book. How do we do this as a, as another, as a, you know, a broader audience to teach what it is I do in my clinic. So we were writing another person's story while using a workbook when I got stuck in Hawaii and turned that into an online course. So the online course is what the book will be. I'm really praying to God I can have this book ready for you guys to receive in, in the month of December now because I'm further behind than I wanted to be, but that's life. Um, and as I was looking at how do I strengthen her body, uh, we had taken her all the way to the end of the course as far as her algorithm and where was she in her ability to resurrect her health. And that was she was doing 72 hour fasts. Now for those newbies out there, please do not step over um, the threshold and say, oh, Grandma Rose was doing 72 hour fast. That's what I should do. No, 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 don't do that. You have to be healthy enough to do that. And indeed, she was very healthy. Uh, not, only, not only was she doing we, I think 11 weeks of 72 hour fast consecutive before she got COVID. Uh, she increased uh, her, um, her time that she spent in the hyperbaric oxygen chamber. She had one of those from when we took care of her cancer. Um, but she also was uh, posting her numbers to the community online. Uh, when you take that course, you become part of a, a, a group of people that are educated and educated about how do you progress through this advancement in the ketogenic journey. And when you're with other people that are talking that way, you can see, oh, I don't want to go to that next level. I don't think I want to do a 36 hour fast. I don't need to do that. And then you can see other people like you who are struggling, who take the next step. And she was the best student. <laughs> she was 76 years old. She had done 11 72 hour fasts in a row. She was posting her numbers as she was doing them. And she was doing exactly what I tell patients to do, which is form a tribe. Uh, not form a tribe where you need get COVID, but form a tribe, get part of a support group that is doing this process together. So as she's living her life in these 11 weeks, she continually checks in with us. She's, uh, she took care of my kids for like three weeks there when I, uh, my husband and I went to Texas. Um, she, she was doing great. Uh, and again, the healthiest she's been in 30 years. So when she heads back home and she's living on the farm and she's doing great, uh, she is back to volunteering at the local thrift store. And I tell her mom, you know, that's another risk for getting COVID. Um, the local public school had shut down. The whole school had shut down because so many kids were out with COVID. And she goes, yes, honey, I know, but I've spent my whole life volunteering and I know that's what God asked me to do. So as I go to do this, I'll pray, but if I get COVID, I would rather go out living than dying. And whenever she would say that statement, we both saw that in the 2013, 14, 15 version of her health, she was living as she was dying. She was, she was a walking zombie. She wasn't healthy. She slept all the time. She could have never cared for my dad for his dying days in the health she was in then. Uh, she was alive and she was healthy. She was vibrant. And that's probably where she got COVID. Uh, if I look at what happens in the next 10 days, she had a little bit of a chest cold. Um, and for the previous four years, we had done pretty much everything to say, stay away from the physicians as much as you need them. We need them for chemotherapy. But all of her chronic diseases had become less and less and less and less. And going into a medical clinic today means there is a risk of getting exposed to COVID there. Um, but her chronic diseases were really limited to one thing, and that was cancer. She had cancer that was very low level and she was healthy. So when she had an upper respiratory infection, I, and I went out and I thought, well, uh, let's see how your lungs sound. Let's get you a little bit of nebulizer. Maybe that'll make you feel better. And she didn't look bad, but I wonder if that's where COVID started because over the next five days, she gets even more congested and she went into the local clinic and got tested for COVID. Um, she got the results back 
and she's walking around doing well. Uh, but it's definitely taking a toll on her. She's definitely more tired and she walked into the hospital. She, she didn't like go in on a wheelchair or in an ambulance. She walked into the hospital and said, I have a positive COVID test and I'm having a, more, a tougher time breathing. And that was a Saturday. And over the course of the next three days, the amount of pressure it took to keep her lungs aerated was higher. Um, we all know, I mean, many of you might not know that um, uh, when looking at the COVID infection, it is a response of your system, uh, specifically the response of the cytokines within your body and how they react to that virus. And she did have a nice, healthy response. But about the time her body started to fight off that infection, the numbers for her cancer shot up. And if, if I had to guess why that happened, she did get a bunch of steroids, which is part of the protocol. That's what you're supposed to do. She got remdesivir. I wish she would have gotten it probably four days before she got it. I think it would have helped her system to not stay away from the physicians and the medical, which is what we told her. It's what we talked about for you know, the, the three years prior because she was so healthy. Uh, just um, the less time in the, uh, in the medical <laughs> soup, <laughs> it, the, the better it was for her. So she got into the hospital. Um, it takes about 48 hours before she's on BiPAP. Um, it takes about another 36 hours before she's intubated. And during that time, nobody could go see her. I couldn't see her. My brother and sister couldn't see her. Grandkids couldn't see her. But there was a moment where they needed some paperwork before they intubated her. And we walked up to the, to the ICU and through the glass, she sees my, my son and I. And you can see, with, it's right before they intubate her. And when they intubate them, they put them, paralyze them and put them to sleep. And she does this sign language of, I love you, I love you, hugs and kisses. As the last thing I ever see from my mom. And as you look at what happens after she got intubated, the intubation is when the body can't do the fighting anymore. And she was, she had been fighting to breathe for four and a half, I think five days by this point. And oh, actually, I think it was six days that she'd been working through BiPAP and CPAP and BiPAP and CPAP and, you know, squirming around the bed and doing all the things. But one of the other problems when COVID's cytokines get really high is it triggers blood clots. So as soon as they put her to sleep and they paralyzed her, which is what you would do when you intubate someone, she now can't communicate, but her own body's defenses are going to be blunted as well. And she gets two big blood clots in her legs and the blood clots grow and they take off and head to her lungs. So now on the air side of her lungs, she has COVID turns on the faucet and in comes the fluid. And the fluid makes it impossible for you to put oxygen in the blood. But now on the blood side of things of her lungs, she's got a bunch of clots. And even when you put them on heparin and you stop the clot from growing, you now have a huge part of the lung that doesn't get oxygen and doesn't get blood. One's from the infection side of things and one's from the the blood clot side of things. And COVID is an inflammatory process. And the reason why it's so dangerous in people with chronic illnesses <clears throat> is because it ran your body has been ramping up the amount of cytokines that it makes every day. And the cytokines are important. They are what your body will use to fight off that infection that by the time she's on the third day of intubation, she actually has been cleared that she's no longer passing COVID. The COVID virus is gone from her body. It is the consequences of what COVID has done has turned on inside her system. And in the first 10 days, uh, she did really well. Her body fought, 
she was able to prevent the problems. She was able to aerate. She was able to fight. I mean, she fought for eight days before the blood clot hit. And there's no way her 76-year-old mitochondria four years ago could have done that. They weren't healthy enough. But she was, if there was ever a chance that she was going to live through COVID, it was going to be when she had that strong mitochondria. And mom, I am going to miss you forever. <laughs> but I am so thankful that you were the healthiest version of you that you've ever been. And I know, I know what my mother would say. She would say, Annette, <laughs> God gifted you this power and this intelligence and this passion to help, help people get healthy. I'm a farm kid from the middle of nowhere. Nobody in my family was, was going to be a doctor. It was only my mother that believed I could be. And thanks to her, and especially the story of resurrecting her health 20 years into my medical career, at when a time I wasn't planning on doing that, I just, this was God's gift saying, guess what, pour into this one patient and do a really good job. And it's through those steps of what, what we teach in this online course, <clears throat> what will come out in the book that's not quite done yet, <laughs> but will be soon. That's how she had a chance in, in hell, in heaven, for living through COVID. And I know she would want me using this in my practice and in my life to help other people. And it's how I'm going to get through the rest of 2020 is focusing on getting this book done, getting the workbook done so that you don't have to pay $300 for the course. You can pay 25 bucks for a book and workbook. And that will be the tools that I use in my clinic and that I use in my mom. And I just want to say that for everybody out there that has um, poured into my life over the last 14 days, um, 21 days, whatever, three weeks. Um, I do greatly uh, appreciate your support and your encouragement. Um, I've had many people reach out to say, could I send flowers? And I would tell you, my mother did acts of service in every chapter of her life. And the most recent act of service she was working on is her cute little church in Plankington, South Dakota which is population 800 people. She was the, I don't know, vice president this year, but she's been everything in that church. And what they are, were working on is they have a mud for a parking lot. So for those of you that have been watching the channel, you'll know that I just buried my dad four months ago. And uh, my mother said, we were working on raising funds to get the parking lot paved, which, I can't believe it isn't paved in 2020, but it's not. And again, when we had her funeral, we all got muddy. <laughs> so I just know that if you are looking for a way to honor her, um, in the show notes, I'll put the link to the church parking lot fund. Uh, and I'm sure any amount of contribution that you want in honor of my mother will be greatly appreciated, but will be mostly appreciated by her community in honoring her uh, as they grieve in losing a huge, huge moment of example to the strong women in their community, to the people who do acts of service uh, throughout the world and see how do you take that act of service and you play it out for a lifetime. And if you want to hear more about that, you can check out my eulogy for my mom. It was by far the most difficult uh, oration I've ever written and ever delivered. Even harder than this. Uh, so I'm just going to sign off saying, I love you, mom. I'm going to miss you forever. After every show, I used to call you and say, what'd you think, mom? Did you understand? Did it make sense? And I always knew if she understood, then I hit the mark. But if I talked over her head, then I probably talked over most of the people that were watching. So I'm going to miss you forever, mom. We'll see you next week, everybody. Improving your health, <laughs> one ketone at a time.